In this episode, I'm going to show you how investing in Canadian dividend stocks can provide great returns in the long term. And I'll also show you a Canadian company that has returned over 850% since 2007. Hi, I'm Kanwal Sarai, and welcome to the Simply Investing Dividend Podcast. In this episode, we're going to cover the following three topics. We'll start first with a general overview of the Canadian market. Then I'm going to talk about some virtual monopolies that we have here in Canada when it comes to Canadian stocks. And then we will take a look at some Canadian stocks, dividend stocks, and we'll take a look at their performance over uh, the long term. So let's get started with our first topic on the Canadian market. Now, before we start, just a quick reminder to all of our listeners, our approach to investing is to build a resilient portfolio that's going to generate growing income for you each year. The key word here is resilient, regardless of what happens in the stock market. Stock market can go, can go up, it can go down, we can have recessions, we can have market downturns, but it doesn't matter as long as our portfolio is generating increasing passive income each year for you. And that passive income is coming to you in the form of dividends. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll know that a dividend is the company sharing its profits with you, the shareholder. So if a company is paying a dividend of, let's say, $1 per share and you own 1,000 shares, you'll receive $1,000 every year for as long as you own those shares and as long as the company continues to pay the dividend. And the money gets deposited directly into your trading account as cash. So you can then spend those dividends if you want, or you can reinvest them. It's entirely up to you. So now let's get started with this episode. We're going to take a quick look at the Canadian marketplace. So Canada is the 10th largest economy in the world. It has a GDP of over 2.1 trillion US dollars. And Canada also has a GDP per capita of over 54 thousand dollars US and it is the second largest country in the world by landmass at almost 10 million square kilometers and Canada has a population of 41.2 million now it is also one of the world's largest trading nations with a highly globalized economy the Toronto Stock Exchange is the 10th largest in the world by market cap. The TSX, Toronto Stock Exchange, lists over 1,500 companies with a combined market cap of over 3 trillion US dollars. So that is a fairly large uh, marketplace for stocks. Canada is also the fastest growing country in the G7. And the top five key industries in Canada as a percentage of GDP are real estate, manufacturing, mining, finance and insurance, and construction. The top exports in Canada, and we're going to start with the number one, is going to be energy products. Canada is the fourth largest crude oil exporter in the world today. Next top export is going to be mining products then forestry, and then automotive. So now let's move on to our next topic. Now we're going to look at specific Canadian stocks because we've just talked about the Canadian marketplace as a whole. Now let's focus a little bit more closer on Canadian stocks that are trading on the TSX today. So what are virtual monopolies? So everybody knows a monopoly is a single company, a single person, or a single corporation that owns the entire market share. So in Canada, we don't have a single company that owns the entire market share in a specific industry, but we do have just a handful of companies. Sometimes it's just going to be two or three companies that together 
I refer to them as virtual monopolies because they own the majority of the market share in their industry. Now, this isn't good news for consumers because that means there's very little competition. The companies can charge what they want. So from a consumer standpoint, not so great. However, from an investment standpoint, these companies continue to be profitable. They have a history of profitability and they have a history of paying dividends and increasing dividends to shareholders. Not all of them, but most of them uh, can do that. Because they are virtual monopolies, they don't have many competitors in the space, so they continue to run and generate profits over the long term. So if we look at Canada's food retail sector, you can see that Loblaw, Sobeys, and Metro, the three biggest uh, companies in this sector, combined own almost 60% of the market share in Canada. Then we take a look at the uh, telecom sector. And in Canada, we have Rogers, Bell, and TELUS. Those three companies combined own a total market share of 90%. So 90% of the telecommunications market in Canada is owned by Rogers, Bell, and TELUS. So regardless of what kind of cell phone you have here in Canada or what kind of internet service provider you use at home, your data is somewhere at some point going to be traveling on either Rogers, Bell, or TELUS networks, or maybe even all three depending where you are in the country. So these companies combined is what I refer to as virtual monopolies in this sector here. Let's take a look at the airlines. So in Canada, we have two, only two major airlines, Air Canada and WestJet. And combined, they own more than 81% of the market share in Canada. And finally, the last sector we're going to look at is the banking sector. So in Canada, the banking sector is very different from the way it is in the U.S. In the U.S., we have hundreds, thousands of different banks spread all across the U.S. In Canada, what you see on the screen here are the five largest banks in Canada. So we have the Royal Bank of Canada, which is the largest. Then we have TD Bank. We have Bank of Nova Scotia, Bank of Montreal. And then we have the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, or CIBC. In Canada, you can go anywhere in the country and you will find br uh, branches, uh, banking locations from these five uh, banks that you see up on the screen here. So you could be in the West Coast and you could live in the West Coast. You could be traveling in the East Coast and you can do your banking at a local branch in that part of the country and it would be the same as if you were banking at home. So there are benefits here to the consumer in that the banks all operate the same way. Um, they have similar fees and we just have just five large banks in Canada. Now we don't have time in today's episode to review each one in detail. We're going to do a quick overview with just two of them just to give you a taste of what uh, a little profile of what these banks look like here in Canada. So if we take a look at the Royal Bank first, the Royal Bank of Canada, which is the largest in the country, the bank was founded in 1864. So it's been around for a very long time. Uh, they have a little over 17 million clients worldwide. They have over 90,000 employees. And the Royal Bank is the eighth largest bank in the world by market cap. And they have customers in Canada, in the US, and in 27 other countries. So they do operate internationally, and they are not just in Canada. And the other profile we'll look at is the Bank of Montreal, or BMO, was founded in 1817. They have 13 million clients worldwide, over 55,000 employees, and Bank of Montreal is the 13th largest bank in the U.S., ranked by total assets. And they have customers in Canada, the U.S., and in 30 other countries as well. So again, an international bank. They just don't operate in Canada. They operate in a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, interesting fact about Bank of Montreal. 
they hold the world record in Canada for paying the longest number of years for paying a dividend. So the company, as I mentioned before, was founded in 1817. In 1829, Bank of Montreal started paying a dividend. And they've been paying a dividend ever since. So they've been paying a dividend for over 195 years, which is an incredible track record. And we're going to take a look at uh, the dividends for these five banks in just a couple of minutes. And we're going to look at it in more detail. So now everybody remembers the 2008-2009 financial crisis. This was not a good time to be a bank, um, especially even in the U.S. Uh, a number of banks uh, went bankrupt or were merged with other banks. So Washington Mutual went bankrupt and just disappeared. Bear Stearns, same thing with IndyMac. Uh, in fact, in 2008, there was 25 other banks that failed in the U.S. And then in the following year, in 2009, we, there was another 140 banks that failed in the U.S. Now, in Canada, we were a little bit luckier or lucky in the sense that we did not have any banks that failed during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And this is due to the fact that there is a little bit more regulation in Canada. Um, but the good news is because there was no failed banks in Canada, as an investor, especially a dividend investor, investing in Canadian banks, for example, was less risky than investing in U.S. banks uh, during the same time. So now let's take a look at what happened in Canada with the five banks. Now I've already mentioned they didn't go bankrupt. They survived the 2008-2009 financial crisis. But let's see what happened to the dividend. Because this is a comment I get a lot where people will say, well, look what happened in 2008-2009. In the U.S., a lot of the banks went bankrupt. A lot of the banks, I wouldn't say a lot, but of some banks cut the dividend, reduced it, or eliminated the dividend. Companies, other companies, uh, reduced the dividend as well. Um, so the question comes up over and over again is then what happens to the dividends during a period, period of market downturn or a market crash? So now we're just going to look at the five Canadian banks and we're going to see what happened during the period of 2008 and 2009 and what happened to the annual dividends paid out by these companies. We're going to start in the year 2007. So we'll start a year before the crisis happened. And then we're going to cover 2008, 2009, all the way to 2013. And then we'll fast forward to 2024 as of this recording, and we'll see what the dividend is today. So if we take a look at the Royal Bank, you can see that the annual dividend per share back in 2007 was $1.82. The following year, it was they raised the dividend to $2.00. The following year after that, they kept the dividend the same, to $2. And then in 2010, also left the dividend unchanged at $2. Then the dividend went up a little bit to $2.08. Uh, after that, it went up again, $2.28. In fact, the dividend has gone up every single year at the Royal Bank since 2011. So consecutive dividend increases. And today, as of this recording, the dividend is now sitting at $5.52 per share. So the good news is the company did not reduce the dividend in 2008-2009, and the company did not eliminate the dividend. So that's the good news. The bad news is the dividend didn't increase. So in 2008, uh, sorry, 2009-2010, the dividend did not increase so it stayed the same but still that is better than having a dividend cut or a, a dividend reduction let's take a look at the TD Bank same thing we can see that the dividend back in 2007 was a dollar and six cents and the dividend today as of this recording is four dollars and eight cents and the dividend has gone up every single year since 2011 However, you can see in 2009 and 2010, 
you can see it on the screen, TD Bank kept the dividend the same at $1.22. Bank of Nova Scotia, same thing. The dividend remained the same in 2008, uh, sorry, in 2009 and 2010. And then after that, the dividend kept going up and today it is sitting at $4.24. Bank of Montreal, same thing. They kept the dividend the same for a little bit longer from between 2008 to 2011, they left the dividend unchanged at $2.80. And can you guess what happened to the dividend at CIBC? And if you guessed the same between 2008 and 2010, you were right. So those three years, the bank kept the dividend unchanged. So as dividend investors, we're always looking at companies that are increasing their dividend. Because every time a company increases the dividend, that's more money in your pocket. And as a dividend investor, that is what we are going to rely on as passive income. So we're looking for dividend increases. However, in these circumstances, like 2008, 2009 was not a normal year. It was a financial crisis. The market tanked, especially the bank stocks tanked and so it was extraordinary circumstances but the good news is here in Canada the dividends were not reduced and the dividends were not eliminated they kept the dividend unchanged so what we can see on the screen here we're looking at all of the five banks the one thing that is in common across all of them is that between the year 2009 and 2010 they all kept the dividend unchanged. And now fast forward to this, uh, as of this recording, you can see the dividends are much, much higher than they were back in 2007. So if we go back from 2007 till now, so that's 17 years, we can see that the Royal Bank has increased its dividend by 203% since 2007. The TD Bank has had the biggest increase of 285% increase in its annual dividend since 2007. Bank of Nova Scotia, we can see is 144% increase. Bank of Montreal, 123% increase. And CIBC had a increase of 131%. Now remember, every time the dividend increases, that's more money in your pocket. And based on what you see on the screen here, TD Bank, is uh, has had the largest dividend increase since 2007. So now let's take a look at some uh, real life examples. We're just going to go th uh, look at three different companies, real life examples of Canadian dividend stocks. And we're going to see how well they've performed over the last 17 years. And we're going to see were they good investments or were they bad investments? And so that'll give you an, an idea or an indication of the performance of, uh, in general, of Canadian dividend stocks. So we're going to look at three companies. We're going to look at Fortis. We will then look at the Royal Bank, and then we'll look at Metro. So Fortis was founded in 1885. They have over 9,500 employees. And Fortis operates as an electric and gas utility company in Canada, in the United States, and in the Caribbean. And this company has had an impressive 50 years of consecutive dividend increases. So I've said this before in other videos. Think about how many market crashes we've had in the last 50 years, how many market downturns we've had in the last 50 years. But this company has continued to not only pay a dividend, but also increase it every single year for the last 50 years. The other company we're going to look at is the Royal Bank of Canada. It was founded in 1864. Again, number of employees is over 90,000. Royal Bank of Canada operates, of course, we know it's a bank, or they refer to it as a financial service company worldwide. And consecutive years of dividend increases, we've seen this in the previous slides, it's been 14 years of consecutive dividend increases. Only because in 2008, 2009, 2010, they, did, they 
kept the dividend unchanged. They didn't increase it, just left it alone. Uh, so that's why they have 14 years of consecutive dividend increases. And the last company we're going to look at is Metro. It was founded in 1947. They have over 97,000 employees. And Metro, through its subsidiaries, operates as a retailer, franchiser, distributor, and manufacturer in the food and pharmaceutical sectors in Canada. So they own grocery stores and they also own pharmacies. And Metro has had 24 years of consecutive dividend increases, which is an incredible uh, track record. So now if we look at all three of these companies, Fortis, Royal Bank, and Metro, let's assume you invested $10,000 each in each of these companies back in 2007. What would the performance have been like today, by, by now, if we calculate the total return? And what we're gonna add in here is not just the stock price appreciation, but also the dividends received over the last 17 years for each of these companies. So we're gonna add up all those dividends plus the stock price appreciation. And you can see that $10,000 invested in Fortis would be worth over $31,600 today. $10,000 invested in Royal Bank would be worth over $40,150 today. And $10,000 invested in Metro would be worth over $95,000 today. And if anybody is looking at the total rate of return, if you're looking at a percentage, you can see it up on the screen right now. So Fortis, since 2007, including dividends, has returned over 216%. Royal Bank has returned over 302% and Metro has returned over 851%. So these are incredible rates of return since 2007. So you can see that these Canadian companies have done very well for their investors. Now, even more important to us, instead of just looking at the stock price appreciation, is the dividend yield based on the purchase price. And they refer to this as the dividend yield on cost. So for Fortis, today, your $10,000 that you originally invested would be earning you 9% a year in cash, in dividends, every single year. And if Fortis increases the dividend, like they've done in the last 50 years, that 9% is going to go up next year and the year after that, and the year after that. So it'll get higher, higher, and higher. With the Royal Bank, the dividend yield based on the purchase price is 11%. So it's 11% return on $10,000 every single year in cash as dividends. And Metro, you can see, has an impressive dividend yield based on the purchase price of 15% a year. Even given the high interest rate env environment we are in today, you cannot make 15% return a year in any term deposit or bank account or bond. So that is an incredible rate of return. While you're holding on to those shares, you're going to be getting, as long as the dividend keeps coming in, 15% a year in dividend income just from your investment in Metro. And of course, there's been stock price appreciation. And so the value has gone up very high. And we can see if we combine all three companies together, so that's 10,000 in Fortis, 10,000 in Royal Bank, 10,000 in Metro. So that's a $30,000 investment back in 2007. Today would be worth over $166,700. Again, that stock price appreciation, including all the dividends. So that is a, this portfolio just made up of three companies would have increased in value by more than 456% in 17 years. But remember, what's important to us more so than the stock price is the dividend. And so the dividend yield is for Fortis, hopefully next year it'll be in the double, double digits and Royal Bank and Metro are already in double digits at 11% and 15% respectively uh, for uh, the 
return on your investment while you hold on to your shares. So we can see that Canada provides a little bit more diversification. So if you are in the US and you're thinking about investing in Canadian stocks, well, you could and you'd get a little bit more diversification and a little bit more exposure to the Canadian market. Uh, and that goes the same for anyone who's outside of Canada. So that's one of the benefits of investing in the Canadian uh, marketplace. Uh, the other thing is a higher current dividend yields compared to the US. Uh, so I didn't talk about this uh, in much in this episode, uh, but generally you do find when you look at the Canadian banks, for example, uh, Canadian utilities, for example, even the telecom sector, for example, you will see that in Canada, the dividend yields today are higher than their counterparts in the US. So that's an opportunity for you to earn a little bit more than you normally would with uh, stocks in, in America, for example. So you are gonna get uh, higher dividend yields. So that's another benefit of investing in the Canadian marketplace. And the last one, I put that in there mostly because of the Canadian banks. And so we have seen how they performed in 2008-2009 financial crisis. And so the Canadian banks provide a little bit less risk than you would get with uh, the U.S. banks, uh, right? And there's a lot more U.S. banks to choose from. So the challenge is how do you choose that from that many banks when there's hundreds and thousands of them? Uh, Canada is very easy. We've got the top five big banks. And so the key here uh, in Canada is over time, when these virtual monopolies that I showed you in today's episode when they become undervalued and when they're still quality companies, that's when you want to acquire them and invest in them and then hang on to them for the long term because the focus for us is the dividend income, more so than the stock price itself. So then the question is, should you invest, go ahead right now and invest in any Canadian stock right now? And the answer is no. There's a couple more things we need to check, right? You want to make sure that you're investing in quality dividend paying stocks. So not just any stock, it's got to be a dividend stock, not just any dividend stock, it's got to be a quality stock. And you want to be able to buy it when it's priced low, when it's undervalued, not when it's overvalued. And so I talk about that in episode one. If you want to go back and watch episode one, I teach you exactly how to figure out when a, a stock is priced low. And so when you're looking at any stock anywhere in the world, not just in Canada, how do you know that it's a quality stock and how do you know it's, that if it's priced low? Well, for that, I've created what I call the 12 rules of simply investing. You can see the 12 rules up on the screen right now. These are designed to minimize your risk and maximize your returns. And this, uh, the 12 rules, you can think of them as a checklist. So a company has to pass all the 12 rules before you invest in it. If it fails even one rule, skip it, move on to something else. So rule number one, do you understand how the company is making money? If you don't, skip it, move on to something else. Rule number two, 20 years from now, will people still need its product and services? Rule number three, does the company have a low cost competitive advantage? Rule number four, is the company recession proof? Rule number five, is it profitable? Rule number six, does it grow its dividend? Rule number seven, can the company afford to pay the dividend? Rule number eight, is the debt less than 70%? Rule number nine, avoid companies with recent dividend cuts. Rule number 10, does it buy back its own shares? Rule number 11, is the stock priced low? And so there we look at three things. The PE ratio, we, uh, then we look at the current yield compared to the 20 year average yield. And then we look at the PB ratio, the price to book value. If a company passes all three conditions, then it passes rule number 11. And rule number 12, keep your emotions out of investing. So for those of you that are interested, I've created the Simply Investing course. It's an online course, self-paced, and it is divided into 10 modules. So they are video lessons. Module one covers the investing basics. Module two is gonna cover the 12 rules of Simply Investing in detail. Module three, you're gonna learn how to apply the 12 rules to any stock anywhere in the world. Module four, you're gonna learn how to use a Simply Investing platform. Module five, placing your first stock order, step-by-step. Step. 
Module six, building and tracking your portfolio. Module seven, when to sell, which is just as important as to know when to buy. Module eight, reducing your fees and risk, especially when it comes to mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs. Module nine, your action plan for getting started right away. And module 10, I will answer your most frequently asked questions. If you're interested, we also have the Simply Investing platform that tracks over 6,000 companies in the US and in Canada every single day, and it applies the rules to each of those companies every single day. So you can quickly see which companies to avoid and which companies to consider for investing. If you're interested in the course or the platform, you may want to write down this coupon code, SAVE10, S-A-V-E-1-0. SAVE10, this is a coupon code. You're going to be able to save 10% off of the course or the platform if you like. So if you enjoyed today's episode, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button as well. We have a new episode out every week. And for more information, take a look at our website, simplyinvesting.com. Thanks for watching.